All right, guys, so well, let's take a look at the first couple of questions. If you don't know, the Regis exam typically goes in like chronological order. So early in the test, you'll see like the world in 1750. As you get to the end of the multiple choice, you get a lot more current event type stuff, environmental problems, stuff going on in places like the Middle East. So I already know this first source is from the, the 1750 unit because it's talking about the Tokugawa period in Japanese history. All right, so let's take a look at this source together and maybe try to make some sense of it, right? Usually with the regions, you get like a reading and then a couple of questions that go with each reading. Oftentimes the first one is like, okay, I can get the answer right from the source. And then other times the second question or maybe even the third question asks you to maybe make some other kind of connection to the source, maybe a vocabulary term or something that resulted from the developments in the source. But let's take a look. The Edo period followed many years of political and social upheaval. The previous division of Japanese history, known as the Sengoku period, which is the warring states period, so states within Japan going at it, was dominated by wars fought between various political and religious factions for control of the country. So we're talking about how a long time ago, there were many groups in Japan fighting for control. It was kind of like a period of chaos, not unlike maybe the American Civil War in the 1860s. These wars came to an end with the unification of Japan by the great generals Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and eventually Tokugawa Ieyasu, who formed Japan's final shogunate. Okay, a shogunate is a time period, if you guys remember that word, in which a military commander has the real power in Japan, right? So he kind of like has full authority. Ieyasu consolidated his power. To consolidate your power means like you take more control over more things, right? You run basically all the elements of the government. So he consolidated his power through a series of social changes, including the introduction of a strict class system and the tight control of the ruling daimyo families. Daimyo are like rich landowners who controlled a lot of territory in, uh, in Japanese society. So they controlled the daimyo families from the capital city at Edo. Maybe if you guys have done a lot of questions, you might remember that one of the things that the Japanese leaders did as well as the French leaders is that they made the rich landowners live really close to the capital city, if not in the actual capital city. Do you guys remember why they did that? So they don't plot against you, right? So King Louis XIV in France made the rich, lo, uh, rich nobles live in the palace of Versailles. The Japanese shogunate makes the nobles live in the capital city of Edo to keep watch over these people and make sure that no one is out to get him. Good call. Individuals had no legal rights and the family became very important at all social levels. So based on the passage, what was one way the Tokugawa shogunate affected Japanese society? Right, so when it says based on the passage, we can answer it based on the source. So if one of these things is not here, we can't pick it. You guys wanna take a shot at this one? Like which one of these things do we actually have in the source? Number one, yeah, the unified Japan. How do I know? There it is, unification of Japan, right? There was nothing in that source about promoting trade. There was nothing in the source about modernizing industry, right? Typically that implies using like industrialization and factories. Don't see anything about factories in the source. And I don't see anything about eliminating social classes. That's like one of those weird opposite answers, right? They said here, they introduced classes. So be careful with that, right? Even though it says class system, don't pick social classes because they're saying in the source that they used social classes. The answer choice says they eliminated social classes, right? But literally it says he unified Japan. Boom, unified Japan. That's a nice easy one. Here's the really hard one though. Based on the passage, which political idea evolved during the Tokugawa shogunate? And if you don't know what any of these words mean, you're taking a guess out of four choices. Let's try to always boil it down to like two choices. Can someone tell me like a really basic definition for democracy? People can participate in their government, right? People have a say. Typically in a democracy too, your, your freedoms are protected. How about absolutism? Do you guys remember that term? Yes, one person has all the power over the government. Someone like a king might have absolute power. How about socialism? Do we remember socialism? Government owns and operates all the businesses. Oligarchy is when there's rule by a few people. 
maybe there's like three people in the government that make all the decisions. So we have to associate one of these systems with the information here. If the guy is taking away people's freedoms, forcing people to live near him, taking power over more things, and they're referring to one person doing all those things. Absolutism is our answer. Absolutely. <laughs> Pun intended. Very good. Excellent, guys. Okay, so some good buzzwords. If you guys can just go into that test, knowing democracy and absolutism, those would be two good words to know for sure. Okay, they come up a lot. All right. Headlines of the 18th century. What years go with 18th century? The 1700s. Economic uncertainty grips society. The king ignores equal representation for all. King executed, terror begins. Tax system seen as unfair. Okay. Which claim about the French Revolution is best supported by the information included in these headlines? Right, so I know these are all about the French Revolution. Now I have to determine which of these statements is true using this source. Let's take a look at choice one. We can learn a lot from the, from the wrong answers, right? The revolution was unexpected as the Estates General met regularly. This is confusing, but the Estates General, if you remember all the way back to the beginning of the school year, was like basically a French version of Parliament, okay, or Congress, where basically representatives gather around and work together with the executive branch to make decisions for the government. So we can't choose that one because of B. The king is ignoring representation. So if he's ignoring representation, we can't say that the Estates General was meeting regularly, right? Because this is a representative body, right? A lot of French citizens would be going and helping the king make decisions. But he stopped doing that, so I can't say that they met regularly. That's tough. King Louis the 16th, XVI 16, was killed because of his belief in consent of the governed. Let's just stop and understand this statement for a second. What does it mean if I give my consent to do something? Allowing. Yeah, you're allowing it. Give permission, exactly. The governed is us. The answer choice is saying the king was killed because he allowed people to have a say in the government. Is that why the king was killed in the French Revolution? No. Absolutely not. Okay, in fact, if anything, it was the opposite. The revolutionary spirit grew out of frustration with the old regime. Do we see people being frustrated here? Yes. We can, right? When I say something is unfair, that sounds to me like frustration. But let's just confirm by looking at the last answer choice. Nobility and clergy were the only victims of terror. Can I make that determination using this? No, right? It's not, it's not specifying any particular social class. All right, so our best answer here is, in fact, choice three, for sure. That's a very hard question, no doubt about it. Which headline is most closely associated with the radical stage of the French Revolution? Let's talk about this word, radical. How would you define radical? In the 80s, it was a word for cool. Trust me, I was there. But what does it usually mean? Extreme, exactly. All right, so we have to pick one of these answer choices that represents the extreme stage of the French Revolution. It is C, who said that? Do you remember anything about the reign of terror during the French Revolution? Like maybe a, a guy who was associated with that time period? Not Napoleon, it's just before Napoleon. Yes, Maximilien Robespierre, right? Basically what happens is the people of France that started this whole revolution were thinking, hey, there's still a lot of people in French society that like the king. If they like the king, they're a threat to all the changes that we want to make. So we're going to round them all up and do something pretty horrible to them. Do you guys remember what they did during the reign of terror to punish the guillotine? Yes, right, rounding people up and having their heads chopped off. All right, so that was the reign of terror. That's the extreme phase. It doesn't get more extreme or radical than rounding up people and chopping their heads off for a different set of ideas than you. Right, that's pretty insane. Who's four for four? Excellent, very good. Let's keep going. I think those four might be the hardest ones on this whole Regents exam. I think it gets a little bit easier from here on out. So we've got questions five and six. 
based on two documents that are very similar. An excerpt from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen and the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen two years later. Very similar ideas. Okay, maybe you guys studied this source when you were preparing, or rather when you were studying your French Revolution units, one of the most famous documents in history. Right? And there's a lot of ideas here that you probably have seen when you studied the Enlightenment. Right? It's basically a document stating that whatever, whatever we do in France from now on, whatever changes we make, our new government should be protecting people's freedoms. Just to do a sidebar for a second, do you guys remember a person from the Enlightenment who was basically saying that the government's job is to protect your natural rights? Right? John Locke was a big proponent of that. Right? So the aim of all political association it's a fancy way of saying government, is to preserve the natural rights of people. But he is specifying man here. Those rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. So it kind of sounds a lot like John Locke, right? John Locke says all people are born with life, liberty, property. So it's definitely echoing the ideas of the Enlightenment. The principle of sovereignty resides essentially in the nation confusing sentence, but sovereignty means control. So the true control of the country should be the nation itself, not one individual. It's kind of implying that all the people have a say in the decisions that the country has made. It's almost like saying that they're going to use democracy in their new government, however that government looks. Right? Decisions will be, made, will be made by a group and not one individual. So if you look at the second source, it's basically the same thing, only we're changing up some of the language, right? Protecting not just men, but also women and men. Otherwise, it's all basically the same thing. So question five says, both documents argue in favor of a government that does what? It is to protect the rights of citizens. Okay, it says nothing in the documents about political parties. It says nothing in the documents about religion, and it doesn't say anything about abolishing social classes. Okay, if you look closely at it, it does say that social distinctions, which I suppose is a way of saying social classes, can only be founded on common service. Right, so it sounds like they're not banning them or abolishing them, but we, we can, we're going to have them to some extent. Meaning if you do good service for your country, maybe you can receive more power and privilege than somebody else. So it doesn't sound to me that they're abolishing social classes, but they are both protecting people's rights, both men and women here, but maybe just men here, right? That's the common phrase for both. So this one should be easy. Whose ideas are reflected in these sources? John Locke. I think it's worth talking about the other people though, for the sake of review, because all these people come up on the regions time and again. Do you guys remember anything about the Adam Smith guy, right? John Locke is the Enlightenment, life, liberty, property guy, right? He said that if your government, you know, violates your rights, you have the right to overthrow it. Do you remember anything about Adam Smith or what ideas he goes with? Good, you got it. Capitalism guy. Believes that the government should not get involved with the businesses, right? We should just use supply and demand to determine people's wages and what things cost. So he's not the natural rights guy, he's the economic freedom guy, right? Let businesses do whatever they want, basically, without interference. How about Catherine the Great? I'd be very impressed if you remembered anything about her. Maybe like, at the very least, what country she goes with? Russia, Russia. yeah. She was, she was a Russian monarch, but she believed in some of the principles of the Enlightenment. So we kind of have a title for people like that. She had educational reforms in Russia, right? Kind of embracing some of those Enlightenment ideas. So oftentimes they call her this, an enlightened despot, if you remember that phrase. A despot is just a fancy word for an absolute monarch. And if I'm enlightened, it means I'm embracing some of the Enlightenment principles, okay? So yes, education reform will be something that she did, okay? The thing is, she's still a despot, right? John Locke's Enlightenment too, but she's still a monarch. She was not elected to that position, and when she, was, when she passed away, power just went to the next person in her family line. We can't choose that person, 
because this is talking a, a lot about democratic ideas. She was not democratic. Maximilian Robespierre is the reign of terror guy. If he didn't like the way you thought, he killed you. Does that fall in line with these right ideas, with these rights ideas? Absolutely not. So John Locke is certainly our best answer. Okay, so if, if you don't remember that, maybe put Reign of Terror next to Robespierre. He's the guy who was chopping off heads, if you still liked the king of France. Good. Let's keep having fun. Okay, new unit of study. Ivory and slaves, if you don't know what ivory is, that's like material that comes, that's elephant tusks, basically, had been the Congo's main exports. Do you guys know which continent goes with Congo? Africa, yes. But Leopold focused on rubber. Hmm, interesting. The mass marketing of bicycles and automobiles in the 1890s greatly increased the demand for rubber and sent prices soaring. When a rubber-producing vine was discovered in the rainforests of Congo in 1890, Leopold forced out the competition and acquired a monopoly on the scarce commodity. Commodity is something you buy and sell, buy or sell. By one estimate, the Congo was producing 20,000 tons of crude rubber a year at a 900% profit. The high return was due largely to cheap labor. Interesting. So if we're talking about a guy named Leopold going to Africa to get rubber. What's the general theme of the document? What's the topic of study, if you will? Imperialism, right? This is a source about imperialism. Maybe we review that word for a second. I guarantee you, you will have questions about imperialism. What does it mean? Exactly. One part of the world conquers another to acquire natural resources or to obtain new markets for goods, right? And that's a fancy way of saying, I want more people buying my stuff. I want to be able to sell my stuff in more stores uh, around the world. So the information in this passage would be most useful to an economist studying something. Let's just talk about that word for a second. What does an economist look at? Or what does the word economy mean? Like what kinds of words, phrases, ideas go with economy? Money. What else? GDP, right, which is a fancy statistic for measuring how good the economy is doing. But what else goes with economic stuff? Besides money, what else? Stocks, trade, production in factories, right, labor forces, all those things go with economic developments. So if that person, what, what, an economist would use this passage to learn about which one of these things you think. Any ideas? Number one, motivations for European imperialism in Africa. Why? Because the, the, the motivations are here. Out of the things we just said, what's the, what's the thing that they're looking for in Africa in this source? Rubber, which is an example of what? A natural resource. Exactly. Okay, so you had to like read between the lines a little bit. Employment strategies used in Europe can't be answered here. Right? Yes, they're talking about cheap labor, but it's cheap labor in Africa. Right? Not in Europe. It's cheap because it's like basically free. Right? If you remember anything about the Belgians in the Congo, they basically enslaved the Congolese and oftentimes did finish physical punishment on the Congolese people if they didn't collect enough rubber. It's pretty harsh. Choice three, reasons for European interest in ivory. They're not talking about why ivory is interesting. They're mentioning that they're getting it, but they talk more about interest in rubber. Right? Why do they want rubber? Because bike tires and car tires. Okay, so they can't pick C. They're not explaining why they want ivory. Importation of European raw materials to Africa is the exact opposite, right? They want to bring resources out of Africa and bring them to Europe. So that's like an exact opposite answer. So number one is absolutely our, our answer here. Which event contributed to the situation described in this passage? So here is where you're asking, you're being asked basically to give a cause for this. So what's an event that caused, like somebody, I think it was Ra mentioned scramble for Africa. So which one of these events most closely goes with countries scrambling to take control over Africa? Yes, the Berlin Conference. 1884, Europeans sat at a table and decided who's going to get what parts of Africa, and the Belgians were going to get the Congo. Without that meeting, perhaps this document doesn't happen. 
If you don't remember any of these other things, when you say British Abolition Act, they're probably talking about slavery here. They're not abolishing slavery in this source, right? If anything, they're using slavery. Sadler Report goes with Industrial Revolution. That's when that guy who worked in Britain for, the, for Parliament was like interviewing kids to try to get a handle on working conditions for kids in factories. This is about Africa, not about British factories, so I can't pick B. And the Napoleonic Code, that should, be, like, that should be pretty easy. What person goes with this? Napoleon. Napoleon goes with which country? France. So this is the set of laws that Napoleon made after he made his empire. That has nothing to do with Belgians taking rubber out of the Congo. Okay, but the Berlin Conference is associated with European imperialism in Africa. Very good. Okay, nine and 10. Equally important to English agriculture, I don't want to assume anything, but I say agriculture, it's a fancy word for what? Farming. Farming, very good. You guys can just call out, no worries. Was the development of new ways of raising crops and animals. About the same time that Townsend was experimenting with turnips and clover, an English farmer named Jethro Tull introduced a new way of planting seed. In the past, farmers had scattered seed over the surface of a plowed field. Much of the seed was eaten by birds or did not take root. So they would just throw seeds onto the dirt and hope for the best. Pretty inefficient, right? This Jethro Tull guy instead proposed planting each seed deeply into the ground and then hoeing around it, meaning like covering it up with dirt and digging up all the roots around it to make sure there's no interference. The result was a heavy crop yield, meaning they produced a lot of crops, because more seeds survived and flourished. Tull increased the efficiency of this process by doing the planting with horse-drawn seed drills and hoes. So basically he invented a machine that you just push down the field and the machine injected the seeds at a specific distance from each other and a specific depth to make farming more efficient. The agrarian revolution, which is another word for agriculture, as it has been called, was, ver was every bit as important as the industrial revolution. The availability of good food combined with improved infant survival and the disappearance of epidemics helped more young live to adulthood and allowed adults to live longer. This meant that by the middle of the 18th century, meaning the middle of the 1700s, more people were having more children and the population grew quicker thereafter. So one of the things, one of the things to keep in mind is that at the same time that you have the factories producing goods more efficiently, you have more efficient farming, right? Maybe that creates more competition for jobs and maybe a willingness to like actually go and work in the factory. Whereas maybe before there was less interest in doing so, if that makes any sense. So which situation was a result of the events described in the passage? Meaning we've got all the new farm technology, population increases our answer, yes. Okay, do we know the difference between rural and urban? Rural is what? Populated. Countryside, right? And urban is? The cities. Okay, so during this time period, people don't migrate to rural areas. Humans for a long time have been migrating to urban areas, not rural. Okay, and if you have improvements in farming with technology, why would you want to migrate to the farm? You've been replaced by a machine. They don't need you anymore. If anything, you're going to go live in a city, try to get a factory job. Development of Marxist ideals. Do you guys remember this Marx guy? What idea goes with Karl Marx? Communism. communism. This is not a, document about, not a document about communism. Can't choose that. Famine in Ireland. Forget Ireland for a second. What's the word famine? Starvation. Are we talking about starvation in this source? No, right? We're talking about food and population increase. It literally says people are living longer. When people live longer, there's more people around. Good. Number 10. Which event brought about similar agricultural changes to those described in the passage? This is tough. Described in the passage is new technology making farming more efficient. I got to find another example of a time period where Farming got better and more efficient. Rob, green. good man, the Green Revolution. Green Revolution, if you don't know, is like 1960s and 70s. Usually in countries like India, they learn how to produce more food more efficiently using modern uh, crossbreeding techniques and fertilizer techniques, right? And that allowed us to support higher populations, right? India is the most populated country on the planet now. That is not possible without the Green Revolution. Ukrainian Holodomor. 
Remember anything about that event? This is a Stalin thing. And this is when Stalin did not like Ukrainians and didn't let them eat. So he'll starve to death. Is this a document about starving to death? No. No. All right, so I can't pick it. Desertification of the Sahara, the desert in what continent? Africa. What is desertification? Does that mean that the desert turns into a chocolate cake? No. Terrible joke. What do we think desertification means? Yeah, it's getting bigger. If the document is about farm technology getting better, does that correlate with the desert getting bigger? No, right? Because if desert gets bigger, we don't have the ability to farm, right? The Aswan Dam, even if you didn't know what the Aswan Dam is, you know what a dam is? What's a dam? Yeah, it blocks rivers, right? And it allows you to divert water to new places. The Aswan Dam is in Egypt. Do you need to know that? No, okay? But this is the only answer choice that goes with better farm technologies, okay? This is just a wall for water. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be used for farming. Green Revolution is the most exact um, answer here, right, in terms of farm technologies. Very good. Oh, finally a picture, my goodness. So, you see this guy, you know it's Gandhi, you should know what country goes with Gandhi. India is the country, for sure. You should also know, when you see Gandhi in India, the style of rebellion that he used to get independence. What kind of tactics would you call them? Civil disobedience, another way of saying it is peaceful protest. They mean the same thing. And maybe it's worth knowing what country he was fighting against to get Indian independence. Yeah, Britain. All right, so the photograph is showing Gandhi, it looks like a Ferris wheel, but this string here. Silk. Yeah, he's, doing, he's making clothing, right? It's hard for me to tell what kind of material it is. It could be silk. It's probably cotton, because that's more of a thing in India. So it looks like he's making his own clothing. That's because this is reflecting something called the homespun movement. Gandhi was like, all right, we need to give the British a reason to leave. If we just make our own clothing and stop buying British clothing, they won't make any money, and then we'll go home. So this photograph is most associated with which key term? Boycott. Yes, how is it, why is it boycott? They boycott yeah, they're producing their own and not buying British goods. If you're boycotting something, it means you're refusing to purchase something, right? You're trying to hurt somebody's business by stopping the purchase of a product. Let's go over the other words though, because they're all gonna be on the regions, just maybe in a different question. Do you guys remember what appeasement means or what time period appeasement goes with? Good man, right? It's a World War II term. And this is when the British and the French kept giving in to Hitler. They're like, all right, we don't want to have another war. World War I was terrible. We're in a depression. We don't want to deal with this. Fine, Hitler, whatever you want, Hitler. It's okay, Hitler. That's a Hitler thing, not a Gandhi thing. Can't pick that. What time period goes with containment? Cold War, right? So during the Cold War, what were the allies, like, let me rephrase that. What were the NATO countries trying to contain? Yeah, uh, they were trying to like, stop the spread of communism. Stop the spread of communism, right? Countries like the US, Britain, France, all the NATO countries. What is segregation? Separation. separation of races. What is the one place we learned about this year where they had separation of races until the 1990s? It was South Africa. <coughs> Just for the sake of review, can we associate a person with ending segregation in South Africa? They called it apartheid. If you don't remember that word, that means racial segregation in South Africa. Who's the guy that used peaceful protests like Gandhi to end that? Mandela, Nelson Mandela. Very nice. Okay, but what is Gandhi doing? He's making his own clothing, why? Because he didn't want to buy British clothing. So boycott is our answer. Whew, 12. Gandhi's activity in the photograph is a reaction to, meaning something happened first, and now Gandhi is making clothes. What happens first? Number one, the British are taking over India. All right, let's keep going. Number 13. We've got a source in number 13 about Ataturk. Maybe before we read the source, we do some brainstorming. You see the name Ataturk, you should associate a country. Turkey's the country. Do we remember anything that Ataturk did in Turkey? Maybe some 
buzzwords, catchphrases that go with Ataturk? He westernized. So what does it mean to westernize? Exactly, bring in Western European traditions, right? Make Turkey like Britain, France, maybe even the US. So that can mean like in terms of dress, that can mean in terms of the economy, industry, the government, all the things that the British and French do, they want to now do in Turkey. Cause that's like seen as like the way to be modern and up to date. So let's see what he does in terms of westernization in this source. Lives were indeed about to be sacrificed for the sake of the hat. That sounds weird, okay. As for the veiling of women, it was officially discouraged, but not banned. In any case, veiling had been largely a middle-class custom, and the middle-class discarded it, meaning the middle-class women stopped wearing veils when they were out in public. That was like an old-school uh, Islamic thing to do, perhaps. The generality of women wore long headscarves, which they drew across their faces in the presence of male strangers. The government of the Republic banned headscarves in official premises, including schools under civil service regulations. Right, so if you were going to school, you were not allowed to cover your face anymore, which is interesting. Elsewhere, they were tolerated and they have remained a feature of the Turkish scene to this day. While the ban on women's headscarves in official premises is challenged every time that official pressure is relaxed. Okay, so it sounds to me that even though the guy is trying to ban veiling and covering of women, some people are doing it anyway. So, so does that mean that everyone was on board with Ataturk in Turkey? No, there's some tension there. A lot of the times when we see questions about Ataturk, they like to focus on the enduring issue of like the tension between modern and traditional. Like maybe one group of people want to make a lot of changes and another more conservative group wants to keep things the same. So what change resulted from Ataturk's actions? That should be easy now. It's three, right? He's westernizing Turkey. He's not promoting Islamic traditions because the Turkish government is not promoting veils, right? They're trying to get rid of veils. Veiling is an Islamic tradition. He's not rejecting modernization. He's embracing it. And adoption of anti-Semitism is not here. Maybe it's worth talking about this word. What does it mean if, what does anti-Semitism mean? Prejudice against Jewish people. Right? What could be an event you learned about this year that represents anti-Semitism? Holocaust. Good. Excellent. 14. Which claim is best supported by the evidence in this passage? Meaning, what can I prove out of these from this source? Meaning, I, I probably have to see evidence of one of these answer choices here. One. Why is it one? Yeah, if something is universally accepted, that means everyone's on board with it. But it sounds like to me, some people are resisting the ban on veiling. How about this word reforms? Do we know that word? Changes, yeah, exactly. Right, so the changes that Ataturk was making were not accepted by all people. Some people, yes, but not everybody. Cool. Freedom of dress was not allowed in school. So I can't pick that one, right? They literally said you can't cover your face. That's taking away freedom. So I have to cross that one out. Respect was given to middle-class women. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell that from this source. Clothing styles were considered unimportant. I don't know, it sounds to me that clothing is very important in this source, right? Literally regulating your appearance. So one is definitely the best answer. Excellent. Try to get it down to two answer choices if you can. Oh, our favorite place to talk about. Israel's changing borders. Oh my God, the, the Israeli conflict, Israel-Palestine, complicated. So if you look at the maps, always look at your map keys and figure out what's represented here, right? So if you go to 1947, it says UN partition plan. What the heck is the UN? United Nations. And what was the point of the United Nations? Keep peace in the world, right? If you guys remember, they made something similar after World War I, but it was a flop. What did they make after World War I that didn't work? League of Nations, right? League of Nations failed because they couldn't enforce decisions. The U.S. did not participate. Okay, U.N. is the sequel. That came out after World War II. So what they decided to do, mostly because the British controlled this region for a while, and they made promises to two groups of people when they probably should not have done that. They promised Arabic people that they would have their own country in this region, and they promised Jewish people the same thing. If I say Arab people, Generally, what religion goes with Arabic people? 
Muslims, and Muslims practice what religion? Islam. Right? So they made promises to Jews and Muslims that they could each have a country here. So they partitioned it. They partitioned the land. What does it mean to partition something? To divide it up. For the sake of review, can we think of another country or region during the same time period that got partitioned? India, right? What happened to India? Exactly, right? They divided up South Asia into Pakistan and India, right? India for Hindus, Pakistan for Muslims. So what do they do here? Same thing, basically. Israel for Jews, Palestine for Muslims. That was the initial plan. But then if you move to maps C, a B and C, things change. Can you determine based on these maps what happens to the amount of land controlled by Israel based on these maps? Do they get more land or less land? It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? It's not a great, it's not really not a great set of maps, honestly. It's kind of hard to tell because the map key changes. But Israel expands, okay? There would be no more Arab state. All of this basically, except maybe this Gaza Strip, everything else is going to be controlled at least to some extent by the Jews. So Israel just get, kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's look at the questions here. Which event most directly influenced the development of the plan? Meaning what happened that led to the UN saying, all right, let's just divide it up and give each their own country. How come it's the Holocaust? Yeah, the world felt badly for Jewish people after the Holocaust. Makes sense. So people were thinking, oh, a lot of Jewish people are moving back here. They believe this to be like their ancient homeland or promised land and their religion. It's the site of like the ancient kingdom of Israel going back like 3,000 years ago, roughly. So once the world started feeling bad for Jewish people, the world community kind of said, you know what, maybe Jewish people need their own country. If they have their own country, they won't be picked on anymore. So that's why they decided to do this. Which group benefited the most from these changes? Here are the changes. Who's benefiting the most? What do you think? Number one, Zionists and Jewish immigrants. If you don't know what a Zionist is, that's just a Jewish nationalist. Maybe we talk about that word, so that goes with this. What's nationalism? If you look at the maps, right, it says here, Jordan controls East Jerusalem, but then over here, it says East Jerusalem annexed by Israel. Annexed means taken over, right? So it doesn't look like Jordan is benefiting at all. Palestinians are the other group that live there, right? They saw their land being taken away. So they're not benefiting at all either. And the citizens of Lebanon are not benefiting. Take a look at Lebanon. They have this territory here, but now a, har a big chunk of Lebanon is controlled by somebody else, the United Nations. So even they lost land. So the only people benefiting from these changes across time seems to be Jewish immigrants, people who moved to this area after World War II. Kind of makes sense, hopefully. Cool. Let's keep going. A source about West Berlin from 1987. Cool. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, that means in this context, more freedom for people, basically, Come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So if you see wall, if you see 1987, Gorbachev, yes, they're refer referring to the Berlin Wall in the source. What's the time period of history? Good man, the Cold War. So which topic could be best be studied by analyzing this excerpt? The Cold War. That's your answer. Okay, the Cold War is the event that's still going on in 1987. World War II ends in 1945. The Russian Revolution is, the, is like 1917 to the early 1920s. World War I ends in 1918. This is the only source that's from the Cold War time period, so I can use it to learn about the Cold War. Makes sense. Maybe we talk a little bit about the Cold War. Who were two superpowers during the Cold War? The U.S. and Soviet Union. Right, both competing to either spread or contain each other's ideas. Right, they're the communist side, we're the capitalist democratic side. What did the Soviet Union do 
to a lot of the countries in Eastern Europe. What kind of, what, they made them something, right? Good man, satellite countries, right? Poland, Czechoslovakia were forced to be communist because the Soviet Union made them be communist. But anyway, the wall referred to this excerpt was used too. So the wall is the Berlin Wall. So the question is really asking, why did they build the Berlin Wall? What do you think? It is too. If you guys remember, before they built the wall, the people of East Berlin were like, yo, communism is trash. Let me go move to the West side where I can have freedom. That, that made communism look really bad. So the communists are like, let's build a wall and prevent that from happening. That's all they did, right? So they're limiting the movement of people. They wouldn't let the East Berliners go to the West side, right? Berlin was weird because Berlin was in like the, the, the communist side of Germany, but half of Berlin was allowed to be capitalist and democratic. Really complicated situation. They're not encouraging the spread of capitalism with that wall. It's just a wall. You're not promoting imperialism with a wall and you're not preventing military cooperation with a wall, right? Cooperation implies like tearing down walls and coming to a consensus and working together. This does not sound like two countries that are working together, right? These are two countries that are opposed. So the wall was built to limit people's movements, right? So try to use process of elimination in case you don't know what the answer is. Maybe you can wind it down to at least two things. All right, Kwame Nkrumah. This is a guy associated with African nationalism and African independence in the 1960s. For centuries, Europeans dominated the African continent. So yet another source about what theme? Imperialism, good. The white man arrogated, meaning claimed, to himself the right to rule and to be obeyed, obeyed by the non-whites. His mission, he claimed, was to civilize, quote unquote, Africa. Under this cloak, the Europeans robbed the continent of vast riches and inflicted unimaginable suffering on the African people. It is clear that we must find an African solution to our problems and that this can only be found in African unity. He wanted all Africans to work together to make Africa stronger. Divided we are weak, united, Africa could become one of the greatest forces for good in the world. Which circumstance most likely influenced the speech? When you see a question like that, it's a fancy way of asking for a cause. Like what happened that caused this guy to stand up and say these things? Which one is it? It is four. Why is it four? It's exactly what imperialism is, right? Europeans controlling the African continent. Okay, that's our cause. When we see this, let's talk about this for a second. This idea that the Europeans came to Africa to quote unquote civilize. What was, what was that? What's the concept that goes with that? Do you guys, did you guys learn about this? I'll just tell you the white man's burden idea. You guys learned about that poem. Did you see that? Right. This is a motive for imperialism as well, right? It's not just about, at least they, they, they told people it wasn't just about, this is a, an R believe it or not. That says burden. Uh, it's not just about getting resources. It's, it's also about teaching Africans the ways of Europe because they thought that if they taught Africans ideas about Europe, it would make them stronger, right? And more sophisticated, right? That's kind of a way to kind of disregard what other cultures are doing, right? You, you kind of want to replace other cultures with your own. Some people might call this like social Darwinism, if you will, right? This idea that weak species are going to vanish. So we better teach species how to be stronger by being European, okay? So that's what he's referring to when he says, quote unquote, civilize Africa. All right, but yes, the Europeans being in Africa is what caused him to have all these complaints about Europeans. Very good. Let's keep going. Okay, um, a cartoon history of U.S. foreign policy, set 19, uh, 1776 to 1976, 200 years of American history. And we've got two guys on the bottom, Soviet taxpayer, U.S. taxpayer, and they're supporting some stuff here. What, what are these things? Nuclear missiles. And then you get to the top and you get two guys looking at each other. If you see this logo, what country? If you see this hat, what country? US. US. And then we see these salt talks, but they're not actually talking about salt for a hot pretzel. Do we know what salt might mean in this context? This is really hard. This, if you don't know, is strategic arms limitation talks. What's arms in this context? Weapons. Weapons. So they're, 
they, they're talking to each other about limiting what kind of arms? Nuclear arms. And I think we can infer a reason why. What's the reason why they're not talking about limiting nuclear arms? How is the taxpayer being affected by all this? Taxes look like they're, they're a burden, right? They're maybe increasing. It's costing taxpayers a lot of money to fund the arms race. So now they're talking about limiting, them, limiting the arms because maybe that'll help their economies. Does that make any kind of sense, hopefully? So which viewpoint is expressed in the 1970 political cartoon? Can I infer from this that one side had fewer nukes than the other? No. How come I can't? They're at their level. Exactly, right? One side is not bigger than the other, so I can't pick choice one. The U.S. paid more for their nuclear weapons. Is this telling me how much each of these cost? No. no. Can't pick it. Cost and instability resulted in arms control talks. So let's assume for a second that you didn't know that this meant this. You could still figure out that this is the answer. How come? Tax, okay, cost goes with taxes. And what's the evidence of instability here? Yeah, it's like a little shaky, right? These things don't look like they're very well balanced. They're unstable. So that is going to be our answer, right? And if they're meeting to discuss limitation talks, they're not saying we need more weapons. Does that make sense? Cool, right? So definitely know, know that in the 1970s, there was a period in the Cold War called detente. It's not detente, okay? It's a French word for easing of tensions. In the 70s, our relationship with the Soviet Union got a little bit better. We start talking to each other. We start reducing our nuclear missiles during a time period of easing tensions. Cool. 21. Which action was a direct result of the event depicted in this cartoon? Three. Limits were placed on the number of missiles in the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Okay, let's look at the other answer choices. The, U uh, the Soviet Union sold nuclear weapons to India and Pakistan. Did these countries get nuclear weapons, though? Yes, they both have them, but they made their own. They didn't buy them from somebody else, nor can I make that connection with this. The power of the U.N. Security Council increased. That's, that has nothing to do with nuclear talks, okay? But if you know that this was about limitation of nukes, this should be nice and easy. Cool. Let's keep plowing through. Let's try to get to all 28, and then we'll call it a day. Deng Xiaoping. What country goes with Deng? China. China is the country. <laughs> there is no fundamental contradiction between socialism and a market economy. You see market economy... You should think of synonyms for market economy. What else is a word for market economy? Free market, market laissez-faire, free enterprise, rhymes with capitalism. Capitalism. You too. The problem is how to develop the productive forces more effectively. Like how do we produce more things in the country? We used to have a planned economy. That's communism. That's when the government makes every economic decision. But our experience over the years has proved that having a totally planned economy hampers the development of productive forces to a certain extent, meaning people don't work as hard in communism. They don't make a lot of stuff and new innovations. If we combine a planned economy with a market economy, we shall be in a better position to liberate the productive forces and speed up economic growth. So basically, that's what China is like today. There are some businesses in China that the government owns and operates, but some that are completely privately owned. For example, there's a company in Taiwan and in China that produces all the, the, the chips and all the iPhones. It's a company called Fox, I'm sorry, Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing. And then another company called Foxconn assembles the phones. To my knowledge, those are not owned and operated by the Chinese government. Certainly not the Taiwanese one, right? That's a source of friction. So they're trying to do a little bit of both. Which problem is best described in this passage? Meaning why, basically what's going on in China that's causing him to say, we need to bring in some capitalism. What's the problem? Well, I wouldn't say that that's a problem because he's saying we want to use a market economy now, right? A market economy is gonna make the country better. 
So if he believes that, I don't think it's going to have many limitations. This is a tough one. Yeah, the slow pace of economic growth, right? He's saying we used to have a planned economy, but it wasn't doing well, right? So what are we going to do to fix it? We're going to bring in a market economy to get people working hard again, right? So that's, that's the problem that he's referring to in the source. So what is he proposing then in the source? Is he rejecting everything about communism? No. no. How do I know that? Because socialism and communism are kind of similar. Favoring capitalism over socialism? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I think there's a better one. Yeah, mixed economy. Yeah, he's saying we should have both. Combine one with the other. Combine communism slash socialism with a market economy. Okay, so some businesses would be owned by the government. Some would not be owned by the government. That's, in his opinion, the best way to run things. So that's what the Chinese came up with in the 1980s and still have today. Keep going. Uh, you know what? For the sake of review, Deng Xiaoping, you know what? Let's take a step back for a second as well because um, they go together and I skipped it before. If you see Gorbachev, he's a person that acted just like Deng Xiaoping did. He brought capitalism into the Soviet Union Right? Do you guys remember the term perestroika? Perestroika is capitalism in the Soviet Union. And that's exactly what Deng Xiaoping did, introduced some capitalism into China. Okay? So if you go back to Deng, he's also responsible for a social change in Chinese history because it was a time period in which China was kind of clawing back from the problems associated with Mao Zedong. So they had a problem in which there was not enough food, but a very large population. So what did he come up with to deal with that problem? One child policy, right? That's the guy that goes with one child policy, All right? Just to give you some extra information about these people. And just for the sake of review as well, do you guys remember any of the, the negative side effects of the one child policy? What happened to the gender balance in China? One sided, right? A lot more men than women in China. Right? And since the population growth is lower now, you have a lot of older people and very few younger people in China. All right, cool. Let's keep going. Our march to freedom is irreversible. We must not allow fear to stand in our way. Universal suffrage on a common voter's role in a united, democratic, and non-racial South Africa is the only way to peace and racial harmony. Oh my goodness, big words. Democracy is when the people have a say. What is suffrage? Big word. Okay, let's write it down then. Suffrage equals the right to vote, right? The women's suffrage movement in US history. You're gonna learn about that next year, right? If you get through this Regis exam, right? So he's saying here that we're gonna have democracy. What does democracy mean? People can vote and it's not gonna be based on race anymore. If you remember during apartheid, which is you know before the early nineties, black South Africans, right? Could only live on certain lands can only go to certain schools and could not participate in their own government. In the quotation, Mandela is referring to the end of which policy? It's three, right? Whenever it's Mandela, it's gonna be about apartheid. Self-determination is when a group of people have the right to rule themselves, right? He's not referring to the end of that policy. He wants that policy for his people, right? By being able to vote in their own elections. He's not referring to the end of forced migration, right? Apartheid is not about migration, it's about segregation. And he's not referring to the end of urbanization. There's nothing here about cities. He's referring to some groups in Africa having rights and some not. That's apartheid. Cool, that should be an easy one. Mandela's support for universal suffrage in South Africa led to what? If he wants everyone to be able to vote, what comes to an end once he becomes president? Number one, the end to white minority control, okay? Because the black population was the majority population. Kind of a weird thing, right? So imagine a country where the majority of the people who lived there could not vote in the elections. But once the, seg the segregation policy is gone, all people could vote and black South Africans were like, why are we gonna vote for white people? They're the ones that brought apartheid, right? So we're gonna pick black South Africans to be president. So Nelson Mandela becomes the first president of South Africa um, once black South Africans had the right to vote. Very nice. Let's do a few more. Some of you guys have seen this map before. 
because it was in one of your homework assignments if you're my student. And yes, even the Regents likes to use images from this upfront website. Maybe you have a teacher that assigns articles from upfront. I'm a big fan of upfront. And it's saying here where your clothes were made. In 2016, the U.S. imported almost 27 billion articles of clothing. What does it mean to import something? Yeah, to buy from somewhere else and bring in. Here are the top 10 countries those clothes came from. So this map is showing all the parts of the world, well, not all the parts of the world, but the biggest parts of the world where they get their clothing from. So, for example, 42% in 2016 of all the clothing that we get came from China. In 2016, 12% of our clothes came from Vietnam, 4% from Honduras, 7% from Bangladesh. So here's a tough one. Which type of social scientist is most likely to use the information on this map? Yeah. Meaning, it is one, it's an economist. How'd you know? Yeah, importing and exporting is trade. It's, it's using currency, it's buying and selling things. I think it's worth talking about these other types of jobs. Like if I say the word historian, what does a historian do for a living? They learn about the past. And usually a historian learns about the past by studying written documents. A sociologist studies like human societies, if that makes any sense. So you might study like the problems of living in a certain community. Maybe there's inequality there or something like that. An anthropologist studies like human cultures, usually by living amongst the group of people that you're looking to study, okay? But an economist is the one that goes with trade. And this whole thing is about trade, right? I'm sending money to another part of the world to get clothing, to bring it back to the US. Which statement is best supported by the information shown on this map? Many African nations manufacture large quantities of clothing. Can I prove that to be true using this map? Some of you guys are saying no, and you're right. How come? Okay, yeah, look at Africa, guys. It doesn't look like we're getting any clothing from Africa. So if we're not getting any clothing from Africa, I can't prove that Africa produces a lot of clothing. Does that make sense? Choice two. Many Asian nations lack the technology necessary for industry. Why is it false? I agree. Yeah, this is all Asia. And look how much clothing they produce here, right? Clothing is made in factories ever since like the seven, late 1700s. So if they're making clothing in these places, it's in a factory. And if they have a factory, they have industrialization. So we cross off one and two. Central America imports the majority of its clothing from India. How come I can't prove that with this answer choice? What's the, what's the map telling us about? The US. I can't learn about Central American imports on a map talking about US imports, right? The US is here, Central America is here. So our answer choice is three. US clothing imports come primarily from Asia. How do I know it's primarily Asia? Yeah, right, right here, proves it. 42% from China, China's in Asia, 7%, 12%. You get some from Latin American countries, but the significant stuff comes from Asia. Based on the information shown on this map, what can be inferred, meaning what educational guess can we take based on the map, from the fact that 42% of imported clothing is made in China? Hmm, look at choice four. The Chinese government encourages export to Central America. Mm. Can I prove that using this map? No, right? Because it's talking about China sending things to the US. So I can't prove anything really about exports to Central America. China has strong legal measures in place to protect the environment. Can I determine anything about environmental protection from this map? I can't. It's only telling me about where clothes are made and how and, and the degree to which the US imports from certain parts of the world. The Chinese government enforces strict regulations protecting factory workers. Can I prove that with this map? I can't, but I can prove number one. Chinese government policies support manufacturing for export. How come I can prove this with the map? Yeah, because they send 42% of the US clothing. 
right? That shows, right? Yes, the U.S. is importing, but that means China is doing what? Exporting. So certainly they do some stuff in that country to promote this. Maybe you can tell me, what do they do to, well, to encourage export? Maybe another way of asking this is, why is so much stuff made in China? Extremely low taxes, if not any, on some of the businesses that operate there. Very good. Why else? The labor is inexpensive, right? There are over a billion people that live in this country, right? That means that the businesses like, can say to workers, oh, you guys want a raise? Well, you know what? I don't need to give you a raise because there's somebody else that wants your job. So I'll just fire you and hire him instead, right? That contributes to wages being very low in a country like that. Same thing in India, right? Over a billion people competing for relatively few jobs helps keep wages very, very low. So a lot of businesses have relocated to China to take advantage of that, right? All the Apple, I shouldn't say all, this is rapidly changing because of a political tension between the US and China today, but many Apple products are made in China, right? All the iPhones are still made in China, but it's gradually shifting to other places like Vietnam, for example, right? Because of the current political tension that we have with that part of the world. Uh, if you have a set of AirPods, I think unless you have AirPods Pro, if it's a new set, it might actually say made in Vietnam on those AirPods now. And they're start, they just opened up an iPhone factory in India. So pretty soon people in India will be getting iPhones that say made in India. So that's kind of a radical change. But still, the vast majority of things produced in China.